Today, we'd like to talk about the current management of aortic stenosis. And we're going to use the 2020 AHA ACC Valvular Heart Disease Guidelines as a background that help guide us through the current management, which has changed significantly over the last decade or decade and a half. The reason for that is the availability of a less invasive therapy that has become available uh, since 2012 in the United States, and that's TAVR or transcatheter aortic valve replacement. As a surgeon prior to this, we felt that we were operating and treating all patients with aortic stenosis. Little did we know that we were only seeing the tip of the iceberg of the disease. Now that we have a less invasive approach, we're seeing a whole new cadre or cohort of patients that are now candidates for treatment that previously weren't when only invasive surgical aortic valve replacement uh, was the treatment of patients with severe aortic stenosis. As a matter of fact, the number of patients with aortic stenosis that are now being treated has tripled uh, over the last 10 years and there are about twice as many patients treated with TAVR as they are with surgical aortic valve replacement in the United States. The availability of the information from the uh, randomized trials of TAVR versus surgery has served to propel this shift in treatment starting with inoperable patients and then going through a downward cascade of risk into uh, high surgical risk, intermediate surgical risk, and low surgical risk patients has definitely expanded the candidacy of patients for treatment of severe aortic stenosis. However, we get the sense that we are still, even though we're seeing a little more of the iceberg right now, there's still a huge portion beneath the surface of patients with aortic stenosis that we are not treating yet. And this has to do with uh, a, the diagnosis, the uh, access to care, and, and the lack of knowledge of the true, pre true prevalence of the disease. For example, we don't know whether aortic stenosis is as common in blacks as it is in whites. Uh, we truly don't know current demographics of male versus female. So there's a lot of focus now on determining the true prevalence of the disease and facilitating access to care, especially in underserved minority populations. One of the things that we are finding is that it's not unusual or unheard of for an echo to be ordered and no follow-up uh, occurring on that echo. So we're finding that there's patients that are actually been diagnosed with severe aortic stenosis or severe mitral regurgitation uh, that have fallen through the cracks, that don't get follow-up. There are multiple uh, triggers that we're trying to put into EHRs to help uh, uh, flag these abnormal studies and echo labs are, are doing this, but it's absolutely critical that once a test is ordered, there's a, a trigger to be sure to follow up on those tests so that the patients that do have valvular heart disease are not lost through the cracks and follow up actually occurs. So the guidelines give us recommendations of, the, of how to evaluate patients with suspected valvular heart disease. And of course, the initial history and physical is, is key in terms of determining symptoms of either heart failure, syncope, chest pain, other signs of aortic stenosis or other valvular heart disease. Current guidelines recommending stages of aortic stenosis of A, B, C, and D. Stage A uh, is patients who are at risk for aortic stenosis. So somebody with bicuspid aortic valvular disease would be uh, an example of that. Stage B is progressive aortic stenosis. So this would be somebody with mild or moderate aortic stenosis that is progressing presumably at some point towards severe. Stage C is patients with asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. So the aortic stenosis is severe, but the patient doesn't have symptoms. Now it's interesting that patients with asymptomatic aortic stenosis in our evaluation of them, only about half the time are truly asymptomatic. It is appropriate to stress test these patients. 
and uh, about half of patients will actually have a significantly abnormal exercise tolerance test uh, when uh, based upon even on the most diligent uh, history ahead of time, the patient appears to be asymptomatic. And finally, stage D is patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis where treatment should be further considered. So in summary, we have four stages, A, B, C, and D, on the basis of symptoms, valve anatomy, severity of valve dysfunction, and the response of the ventricle and pulmonary circulation to the valvular heart disease. Now, the evaluation of a patient with known or suspected valvular heart disease initially, of course, starts with the history and physical examination. If it is suspected that the patient has significant or uh, valvular heart disease, the next step is a transthoracic echo. And a transthoracic echo, what you're looking for is the presence of valvular heart disease, the severity of valvular heart disease, and any consequences of valvular heart disease, including left ventricular function or pulmonary hypertension. Probably the next most important one is a CT scan. And the CT scan should evaluate not only uh, the heart and valve itself, they should undergo 3D reconstruction to determine the particular anatomy of the aortic valve, ascending aorta, as well as peripheral access information in order to determine whether the patient is a candidacy for transfemoral access for the TAVR procedure. Now this is important to do even if the patient is a candidate for surgery and not for TAVR. Uh, a CT scan uh, evaluation of the heart, aorta, and peripheral arteries are critical even if a patient's undergoing surgery rather than TAVR. So once the decision's made that the patient is a candidate for therapy, a CT evaluation is next appropriate. Cardiac MR can be very helpful, especially in low cardiac output stages in determining left ventricular function or left ventricular damage from the valvular heart disease. Biomarkers, specifically BNP, can be helpful in terms of evaluating. Finally, if the uh, severity of the valvular heart disease is not determined, left and right heart catheterization can add significantly to it. Now, the clinical decision-making regarding the treatment of aortic stenosis uh, uh, is best performed by a heart team approach. The guidelines recommending uh, evaluation by patients at valve centers of excellence, where a patient is seen by a multidisciplinary heart team, which consists of at least an interventional structural cardiologist, as well as a cardiac surgeon with expertise in valvular heart disease. There's frequently many other members of the team that are valuable in terms of evaluating of the patient, including imaging specialists, gerontologists, mid-level providers, research coordinators. The decision should be shared decision-making of uh, the caregivers, the patient, and the patient's family determining what factors are important in the patient, what the expectations of therapy are, uh, and what matters most to a patient. Oftentimes, longevity of life is not the primary a goal of therapy for patients, and sometimes it's improved quality of life even though life may not be prolonged by the therapy. Throughout uh, the surgical treatment of aortic stenosis and throughout the trials, the uh, decision making was all based upon surgical risk and the STS surgical risk score was used to profile these patients. What we see now is a shift in the guideline recommendations as the uh, decision is now based on age rather than risk per se. And I think it can be distilled down very simply. The first decision uh, uh, to be made is the patient a candidate for a tissue or a mechanical valve? And this is based primarily on age. Patients that are under 55 to 60 years old should be considered for either a mechanical valve or a Ross procedure as a best treatment option for them. Once you're out of this age range and the decision is made for tissue rather than mechanical, then the age factor is very important. If you're under 65 years old, 
The treatment probably most commonly should be surgery. That's on the basis of the fact that these were the only patients that were included in the randomized trials, and we don't know valve durability of how long a valve is going to last. Also, there's a higher incidence of bicuspid aortic valve disease uh, in patients under 65 years old, and patients with bicuspid aortic valve disease were not included in the trials. So surgery is a class one recommendation in patients under 65 years old. If we go to patients over 80 years old at the other end of the spectrum, then TAVR is the preferred treatment. Even though the outcomes with surgery are the same as with TAVR in older patients, if you have two therapies and one is less invasive than the other, then the less invasive therapy is the preferred treatment by both patients uh, and their referring uh, caregivers. And so we know that TAVR is less invasive than surgery. The outcomes are the same. Therefore, class one recommendation in patients over 80 years old uh, is transcatheter aortic valve replacement with surgery being an option if the patient has particular issues with the anatomy of their valve or high risk for TAVR for any particular reason. In patients between the ages of 65 and 80, both surgery and TAVR are class one recommendations. And again, this is where uh, shared decision making with the patient and their family is crucial. Uh, both uh, surgery and TAVR are good options. In patients who have systemic disease, so for instance, frailty, multiple comorbidities, uh, or at increased surgical risk, TAVI would be the answer. If patients have anatomical features of the aortic stenosis that make them high risk for TAVI, uh, then uh, surgery uh, is the proper. And, and patients that would be high risk for TAVI or TAVR um, include excessive bulky calcification, uh, 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 calcification going into the left ventricular outflow tract, patients that are at risk for uh, coronary obstruction. In patients where they uh, have equal risk for both procedures, more often than not, the patient and their family will choose the less invasive option and therefore TAVR. If there are other comorbidities or other valvular or, or other heart disease present, such as coronary artery disease, mitral regurgitation, etc., then the decision should be made on the basis of that disease. So in other words, if you have coronary artery disease and the treatment, treatment uh, recommendation was going to be cabbage, then that patient should probably get an AVR plus cabbage. If on the other hand, that patient can, uh, coronary disease can be treated with PCI, then a staged TAVR plus PCI would be uh, uh, the preferred option. I think we can summarize this whole area of clinical decision making in patients with severe aortic stenosis as follows. The indications for transcatheter aortic valve replacement are expanding as we have had multiple randomized trials that have shown the benefit of transcatheter aortic replacement compared to surgical aortic replacement. The choice of the decision in a particular patient is a shared decision making process that includes the lifetime risks, as well as the benefits associated with the type of valve being used. In younger patients, mechanical valve or the Ross procedure. In patients under 65, probably surgical aortic valve replacement. And then above age 65, a strong consideration for TAVI. Now, once a patient receives treatment, especially with a bioprosthetic valve, be it surgery or TAVR, they need to be followed up on a regular basis. And a baseline transthoracic echo at 30 days after the procedure is the cohort of therapy for both. Patients should then have a second uh, transthoracic echo at the first year afterwards, and then every two to three years following that. If there is any concerns about uh, uh, post-operative uh, problems or complications, such as periprosthetic valve leak, or, or valve thrombosis, then more invasive imaging, including 4D CT scan, is indicated. We can 
summarize the whole field as follows. The availability of TAVR has expanded the number of patients for aortic valve stenosis, and I think will continue to expand it significantly in the years to come. As diagnostic uh, testing becomes more widely available, as the efforts at increasing access to care for underserved minority populations increases, as we have uh, testing uh, to determine the true prevalence of the disease, uh, I think we will uh, uh, see more and more patients diagnosed with uh, aortic stenosis. The uh, evaluation of treatment should be a shared decision-making process with the patient, uh, including a multidisciplinary heart team, preferably in a valve center of excellence that includes not only the caregivers, but also uh, the patient uh, and the patient's family, and including the patient's uh, 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 primary cardiologist. Very frequently what we find is that uh, uh, a patient has been cared for by a cardiologist for 10, 12, 14 years and then develops severe aortic stenosis and is referred into therapy. It is critical that that caregiver be included in the shared decision-making process because nobody understands the patient's and the patient's preferences better than that physician who's been caring for them for a number of years. So inclusion of the patient's primary cardiologist is a critical part uh, of the decision making for the treatment of aortic stenosis. And lastly, there's a lot of interest in therapies that would slow the progression of aortic stenosis. Uh, over decades now of looking for pharmacologic agents that may slow the progression, uh, so far none have been successful uh, in, in terms of slowing the progression. But developing new trials and new trial platforms which have been bought out of the COVID trial evaluation era may help us find an answer to slow the progression of aortic stenosis. So this is an exciting time in the treatment of aortic stenosis. Uh, TAVR has been a significant sentinel event uh, and watershed in terms of treatment, uh, but this is not the end of the story on the treatment of aortic stenosis. Rather, it's the end of the beginning of the story of treatment of aortic stenosis with many exciting things to come in the near future.